My title, The Raving and Melancholy Madness, is, if I can just go back, is related to this statue, which was above the main entrance to the Bethlehem Hospital uh, about 350 years ago. And it shows the same individual in two phases, two different phases of the same illness, the raving and melancholy madness. We now call this bipolar disorder. It was called manic depressive illness. Um, the two interests that I have professionally are psychopharmacology and uh, mood disorders, <coughs> specifically bipolar disorder, and I think the two go together very well because I think the treatment challenges in bipolar disorder are amongst the greatest uh, in neuropsychopharmacology. So these are my disclosures. This is uh, from a recent publication in The Lancet. Uh, we are now the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, so we have neurology too. Uh, but these are the leading causes of burden of disease, the top 25 uh, causes of global years live with disability. And the green ones are the psychiatric ones, and the uh, purple ones uh, are neurology. And you see that uh, low back pain uh, trumps uh, depression, but depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety, and so on, are huge causes of ill health. And as we see improvements in uh, ischemic heart disease and oncology, uh, and so on and so forth, we will see not only uh, a relative increase in the importance of these disorders, but also, unfortunately, an absolute increase. The one caveat that I would have is that I think bipolar disorder is slightly underestimated here uh, because bipolar 2 and bipolar spectrum is included in major depression, and I'll talk about that in a moment's time. So what is bipolar disorder? It's a recurrent affective or mood disorder typically involving both mania and depression. Bipolar 1, manic and mixed episodes and almost always episodic depression. There is a phenomenon of unipolar mania. I first came across this as a senior trainee. I had a patient who was 65. She had had bipolar disorder for over 40 years. And she told me she'd never been depressed. She said she didn't know what it was like to be depressed. And unfortunately, that lady died of a chest disease, uh, independent. But she had 40 years. She had maybe uh, 20 episodes of mania. And uh, she'd never even had subsyndromal depressive symptoms. So if you look at the literature on unipolar mania, it certainly exists. It's quite rare in Western Europe and North America. We have a paper coming out from our own database and a database in France which shows that perhaps 5% of bipolar 1s are unipolar manics. It's much commoner in places like the Caribbean and Africa, probably because this is not pure unipolar mania but secondary mania due to metabolic causes. I think unipolar mania is of great scientific interest because it shows that mania and depression are not inevitably linked and we intend to study this. Bipolar 2, which is where all the problems come because of the overlap with depression. Subsyndromal states. Rapid cycling bipolar disorder. This was very contentious when it came in in the 70s. David Dunner introduced the term. Uh, he, David tells me it's the paper that he has had the longest time waiting to get published. He said from initially submitting it to a journal to coming out was five years because people didn't like the concept. But I think it's practically a good guide. Uh, it shows where people are less likely to respond to treatment and have a poorer outcome. But people do not stay rapid cycling forever. People move in and out of rapid cycling. This was perhaps shown best in my clinic about a year ago when we were referred a patient for treatment of their rapid cycling, but she had been depressed for 18 months. So by definition, she was no longer rapid cycling. And lastly, mixed states, which we have been very confused about, courtesy of DSM-5, which I will talk about. I think uh, DSM-4. I think DSM-5 is much better for mixed states than DSM-4 was.
So a simple schematic about bipolar disorder. It's complex. It has multiple different phases. For those of you that teach medical students and residents, I think it's worthwhile pointing out how fascinating this disorder is. It's one of the few illnesses in medicine where you can have episodes of the same disorder presenting symptomatically opposite. And that doesn't really happen very often. Here's the natural history. This is from Kathleen Merrick Angus's paper in the archives in 2007. There was an attempt to replicate this internationally by Kathleen and colleagues, and they published a follow-up paper in 2011. But it's clear that in that attempt at international replication, many cases were missed. So, for example, uh, according to that study, there were no cases of bipolar 1 disorder in India, uh, and that's simply not true. But if you look at the better paper, you can see early onset, frequently before the age of 25, a very common disorder, 1% for bipolar 1, 1.1 for bipolar 2, and 2.4 for subthreshold. 75% of patients who are bipolar have psychiatric comorbidity. Now, this is important clinically, but it's also important for our research base because usually we exclude people from trials who have certain comorbidities such as alcohol, substance abuse, and so on. This is very common in bipolar disorder, and this means our evidence base is really inadequate with this regard. Lastly, it's a frequently relapsing disorder. You can see in 12 months, 69% of patients with bipolar 2 and about 75 with bipolar 1 had clinically severe episodes. Now, every experienced clinician, and I'm sure there's many in the audience, know that if you treat bipolar disorder correctly, you can have long periods of people being well. But nevertheless, in its natural state, it's a frequently recurring disorder. So here's the onset. This is from uh, Merrick Angus's paper. This is the first episode of either depression or mania. And you can see that it really onsets with puberty, with depression. Mania is actually, in my experience and in the literature, very uncommon before the age of 15. Thereafter, you see there's a steep rise. There are cases that onset in older life. My own personal uh, record for a patient with a first onset being as late as possible was 65 with no previous depression. We thought it was likely to be due to an organic cause, but we, on prolonged follow-up and so on, there was no organic cause. So you do get late onset forms. The problem is that this period of onset is when many other things happen. So this is a paper by Jacobi et al. Uh, it's confusing, but that's the point. In this teenage and early adulthood period, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, lots of disorders come on. And the diagnostic problem, especially with something like bipolar disorder, is separating out the correct diagnosis. And that's always going to be a challenge for clinicians. So this is a graph which illustrates this. This is from Michael Burke, my friend in Australia. And you can see... Michael sketches out that there may be any symptoms of mental illness, an episode of depression. Remember, people with bipolar disorder will on average have two episodes of depression first, and then mania, and then a full episode of mania. And because of this, the initial diagnosis can take 10 years, because the initial presentation is typically depression. Symptom overlap leads to misdiagnosis. One third of patients are misdiagnosed. And remember the comorbidities, particularly alcohol and substance misuse. I think there's a very fundamental connection between alcohol, so substance misuse, and bipolar disorder. If we look at people at their first episode, the rates of alcohol and substance misuse are very, very increased compared to the matched population. And I think probably related to re reward systems in the brain, there's a deep connection here. Okay, moving on to DSM-5. should, of course, be 5 and not V. Uh, you know about this. It's worthwhile remembering that the big change was DSM-3. DSM-3 
Uh, and I can remember I was a student when DSM-3 came in. It was seen as being a big advance. It made psychiatric diagnoses reliable. In fact, they were more reliable than cardiologists listening to heart sounds. Uh, and since then, there's been an expansion and a tinkering and so on and so forth. But my fundamental message is I think mostly for mood disorders, DSM-5 is a good thing. I think they've mostly done sensible things, and I'll talk about that very briefly. So the first thing I'm not so sure about, uh, there's a separate chapter for bipolar and related disorders from depression. My own view is that this could be interpreted wrongly. I think for mood disorders, you should look at mood disorders in the round. You should look at mood disorders with depression and with bipolar disorder together. Uh, and a separate chapter, given that many people in the United States are rather concrete, uh, I think that may lead people to think there's a bit of a false separation between depression and bipolar. Next thing I think is good. Increased energy or activity has been added as a core criteria. Uh, I think this is not only something which I think is reasonable, I think it's something that we will be able to uh, determine with data from use of social media. There's already papers coming out about texting patterns in terms of uh, uh, changes with mood, people texting faster. This, of course, has to be personalised. If you look at someone like myself, the rate at which I text is very slow. If you look at my children, they text very, very quickly. And uh, if I texted at their speed, I'd clearly be manic or perhaps even have a psychotic mania. But nevertheless, I think that, and I think actigraphy, where you can monitor activity, will give us empirical data to back this up. The mixed features specifier has been added for mania, hypomania, and depression. I think this is a good thing. This allows us to capture the one-third of people with mania who have significant depressive symptoms and the one-third of people with depression who have significant manic symptoms. But please note that this also applies to major depressive disorder. So major depressive disorder, a separate chapter, you can also have mixed features. To me, that argues for the commonality of bipolar and uh, depression. Antidepressant switching, if you become manic during antidepressant treatment and you stay manic or hypermanic after the drug is washed out, this is now a clearly an episode. And lastly, there's other specifiers such as with anxious distress. <coughs> there's a whole great big list of the specifiers and I think this is quite good. This allows us to keep the basic diagnostic category but to add qualifiers which allow us to do post hoc analyses. So here's an interesting paper. I think this is worthwhile trainees reading. This is the reliability of the uh, DSM diagnoses, the field trials. And you can see it goes from not reliable at all, which was, manic, uh, which was mixed anxiety depression, to PTSD and dementia, which were the most reliable. I've picked out bipolar 1 here because bipolar 1 is much more uh, reliable than schizophrenia, much more reliable than bipolar 2, but bipolar 2 is more reliable than major depressive disorder. So within the hierarchy of reliability, I think we should trust bipolar 1 best. My friends in the United States, and Carlo I'm sure has heard this as well, this was done in expert centers, and bipolar disorder one would have been up here, except one expert center scored very poorly. And that's because the diagnoses were done by new psychology assistants who were untrained. To my mind, that says, if used properly, these criteria are very, very reliable, but you cannot abuse them. You have to do things properly. Uh, I won't say which centre that was. Also, schizophrenia, not as reliable as bipolar 1, and schizoaffective, rather strangely, more reliable than schizophrenia. So, bear this in mind, and I think this should almost guide our treatment trials. We should look at bipolar 1 first, we then may look at bipolar 2, and we should then go to major depression. That's not what's happened in the 
previous decades. What's happened is that people tend to have studied depression. They've then extrapolated to bipolar, and it's probably been the wrong way around. So despite the fact that bipolar 1 is defined by mania and bipolar 2 by hypomania, depression is the big issue. There's three studies. This is one by Joffe in uh, Canada. There's another North American one, one in Europe. They all show that patients with bipolar disorder, when followed up over the longer term, are without mood symptoms only half the time. Symptoms are commonly subsyndromal or moderate depression, but you can see how rare hypomania and mania is. So this, to me, explains the problem with diagnosis. You see someone with a depressive episode, especially hypomania may get missed in the past. Anxiety is also very common. Now, this is not a problem for trainees to understand with major depression, but they often think that there shouldn't be anxiety in bipolar disorder because they think of bipolar disorder with mania or hypomania. But the rates of any lifetime anxiety are very high, and they encompass all of them. In my clinic, one of the big clinical issues that we face is residual anxiety symptoms in people who've gotten through their episode of mania, depression, or mixed states. It's a big problem, I think, clinically everywhere. And, of course, personality disorders, the big one being borderline or EUPD. There's a compare and contrast between EUPD or, bipo uh, or borderline and bipolar done here by Lakshmi Yatham. You can see that probably the one uh, phenomenon that's very different is endorsing depressed mood compared to emptiness. Remember, there's a 15% comorbidity, and this is especially true with bipolar 2. There's a very nice paper from Italy by my friend and colleague Ilio Perugi from the Bridge Consortium that showed this, published a few years ago. I think possibly the activity criteria may help. The activity, increase in activity, is much more likely to apply to bipolar than to uh, borderline. So very briefly, the natural history of bipolar disorder. There's an early onset, but not always. Lifelong high risk of recurrence. High rates of depression. Frequent mixed symptomatology. High rates of incomplete uh, remission. And a considerable suicide risk. But bipolar disorder doesn't uh, follow any rules. These are the averages. We all know, every experienced clinician knows, you'll see some patients who have a later onset, some people who may have periods with treatment of being well for decades, and so on and so forth. This is just a brief list of practical considerations which I think we should have in our minds about bipolar disorder. The key point with mood disorders is whether it is recurrent or not. This is what Kreplin said. I think this is much more important than thinking about bipolar or unipolar. At the beginning, you should be thinking about, is this a recurrent mood disorder? And then the severity, the criteria for having a major depressive episode, evidence of mania or hypomania. Remember, hypomania can always be missed. Patients normalize it. They, they don't like to admit to it. My patients who are uh, doctors, I see lots of doctors and psychiatrists, and I've seen two or three cases where doctors and psychiatrists have not admitted to periods of hypomania. They come to my clinic, they want to be treated for the depression. They don't want to be labelled as bipolar. Uh, and we, we see this quite often. Mixed states, psychiatric comorbidity, and physical ill health. Physical ill health in people with bipolar disorder like schizophrenia, like every other psychiatric diagnosis, is an increasing problem. Uh, in the UK, probably about two-thirds of our uh, patients with bipolar disorder have significant physical health problems related to obesity, cardiovascular problems, and diabetes. What's the age of onset? I think this is important scientifically and sometimes clinically. Family history, including family history of treatment. And lastly... What is the functional and neurocognitive status? Now, I say this to a neuropsychopharmacology meeting, but my point is that the neurocognitive status is a target for treatment, and it's emerging that there may be treatments that help cognition. 
Uh, very briefly, there's good evidence, some of it done by my own group, showing that bipolar disorder has a big impact on society. This is important when you're arguing for healthcare spend. So the argument is not that really we spend money in bipolar disorder and it's somehow lost, but if we spend money treating bipolar disorder properly, we save money because the biggest cost of bipolar disorder is admission to hospital or lost human potential. And you can see that that's true for bipolar 2 like bipolar 1. So you can see that bipolar 2 here often scores worse than bipolar 1 on many quality of life parameters and that's because of the high rates of depression. In the UK and Europe uh, we've looked at the costs. There's a Gustafson paper. The ECMP estimated the total cost of mood disorders in Europe in 2010 to be 113 0.4 billion euros. People have looked at this in the UK in terms of costs. My colleague Paul Macron, this is a report you can still access. 2007, total cost was 5.2 billion pounds. This is not just healthcare costs, this is effects on the criminal justice system, social care and others. It's a very, very costly disorder and therefore treatment is a good thing. There's also, as I've said, high costs associated with physical health morbidity. I'm not sure about Italy, but in the UK, patients with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder and depression and all the psychiatric disorders have less good general physical health care. For some reason, being a psychiatric patient means you get a second class service for your physical health care. And this is regrettable. Uh, and this is just angst's long-term study of suicide. You can see the higher the rates of depression, this is over 50 years of course, you can see that the greater the rates of uh, suicide. So I want to move on in the last few minutes and talk about cognition. This has become something of great interest in bipolar disorder. It is of course something that uh, we all use every day without thinking. Uh, but disturbances in our brain uh, can lead to problems with attention, learning and memory and speeding, uh, speed of processing. Multiple mental illnesses show some signs of cognitive dysfunction. I think this probably first came in with Tim Crow's group in London in the 1970s where they pointed out that many people with schizophrenia were really very cognitively impaired. And schizophrenia has led the way, but bipolar disorder and depression have followed. So if you look at the history of looking at neurocognition, the first paper was done in uh, Glasgow in 1978, looking at the effects of drugs. And now there's books, there's probably over 2,000 uh, papers. And this is a summary of what we think about uh, cognitive impairment in bipolar disorder. So patients with, with bipolar disorder have cognitive impairments in attention, memory, and executive functioning. Now, executive functioning is a... Uh, is, isn't particularly well defined. My working definition of executive function at the moment is it's everything that our politicians aren't doing properly. So it's thinking ahead, making plans, having pr appropriate strategy. But even the neuropsychologists can't agree a, a definition. But it's very, very important for our function. Cognitive impairments appear early in the course of illness and persist over time in euthymic patients. Some patients have evidence of a progressive cognitive decline. And this has led some of my colleagues to talk about bipolar disorder being a neurodegenerative disorder. I'm very uncomfortable with that because patients go on the internet, if they read this and they think that bipolar disorders like Parkinson's or Huntington's, I think it will have a very bad effect on people's, uh, people's morale and may actually increase suicide. But I do think there's evidence that some groups have an accelerated decline. And we need to be assessing this more. Now this is the trajectory of cognitive impairment in bipolar disorder. So this is from Lewandowski, who was in our institution now in Harvard. And this is from the Dunedin study. Dunedin is a small city in New Zealand. They uh, looked at a large number of children from the healthy population. They did simple 
tests and followed them up over 20, 30 years. And they were able to show that the group who became schizophrenic lagged behind their peers and then dropped off with the overt onset of schizophrenia. Now, there's a debate in the schizophrenia world about whether this is flat or whether it goes down. Uh, our group has a paper coming out which shows that there's a modest continuing decline in cognition in the schizophrenia group. But this has been well known for decades. Manfred Bloiler and others talked about this. The group with bipolar disorder actually, before the illness onsets, are ahead of their peers on average, about two-thirds of a standard deviation. Bipolars are very often very bright. But with episodes of illness, they have a continuing decrement in their cognitive function. Now, the question is whether this can turn around and people can come back up. And I think that is certainly true. And I'll sh show you some evidence from a couple of trials that we've done, one with drugs and one with a psychological treatment that suggests you can really uh, boost cognitive function in bipolar disorder. And, of course, the fact that episodes of illness cause... Uh, increasing cognitive impairment is undoubtedly related to uh, what's going on in the brain during episodes of illness that eventually ends up in a minor degree of cellular damage. Okay, I want to talk very briefly about treatment and then I'll come back to talk about cognition with treatment. Uh, this is a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, the, the extraction of the stone of madness, which looks at an early neurosurgical procedure. But treatment challenges in bipolar disorder, for all the reasons I've gone through, are particularly great. So bipolar disorder is often unrecognized and undiagnosed. Comorbidities are common. The predominant phase is depression. If we think about what we really want for treatment of bipolar disorder, we want long-term stability. We don't want really just to have data from a three-week or an eight-week study. We want long-term stability and return to full health. And lastly, we want this to be there, evidence for bipolar 1, bipolar 2, rapid cycling, and so on and so forth. And of course, our evidence base at the moment is lacking in these things. Remember, when we look at uh, evaluating any treatment, and this is true for surgery, it's true for devices, it's true for mindfulness, it's true for psychoanalysis. We should be looking at the balance between benefits and harms. Uh, I think for psychopharmacology, we are the most advanced in looking at this. If you look at surgical treatments, very often they, they, they don't do this particularly thoroughly. And also for psychological treatments, there's often a belief that the psychological treatment can do no harm without any evidence to back that up. Bipolar disorder is also complicated by the phases of treatment. So if there's one point to tell a trainee or a student about bipolar disorder, nothing about it is simple. It's complicated in every way. But we, when we think about it, there's the acute treatment phase, the continuation phase, including addressing the tale of vulnerability, and then maintenance. So, what about treatments? Well, psychoeducation, I think, clearly is beneficial. This is Frances Colomb's original paper. Uh, you can see the treatment group. This was really quite a well-done study. The control group uh, was matched on almost every factor apart from the psychoeducational material, and you can see that the outcome was better. And Colomb and uh, Vieta, Edward and Francesc, have followed up over five years. This has been replicated in other centers. There's a nice meta-analysis which shows that this has a beneficial effect. Group psychoeducation appears to be better than individual. There are, of course, some scenarios when uh, we have to do individual psychoeducation. We have a program running with young uh, Muslim women. Uh, they don't want to be in groups. They want to have individual psychoeducation. But for many... Um, for many bipolars, the group is a very important therapeutic milieu. What about pharmacotherapy? Well, we use everything that we use in other parts of psychiatry, and we also 
import medicines from other areas, such as anticonvulsants. If you look at these, the only um, treatment that was really introduced from the beginning for bipolar disorder was lithium, which remains our key gold standard treatment. Others clearly have good efficacy in bipolar disorder, ECT, for example, whereas questions still remain about antidepressants and indeed even antipsychotics. Now this is Andrea Cipriani uh, from Oxford, although originally from Italy of course. This is his uh, network meta-analysis of treatments of mania. We're very good at treating mania. If it was just a case of treating mania and nothing else, we could put everyone on high dose haloperidol and we'd have no problems with bipolar disorder. But you can see from this that uh, there's a number of different treatments, haloperidol, lithium, which are better than placebo. This is a very limited study in many ways. Acceptability was staying in a three-week trial. That's a very crude measure of something being acceptable. And efficacy, again, is based on three weeks. So haloperidol comes out very well, despite the fact that it has the highest rates of post-manic depression. So that's totally missed by this study. But nevertheless, we're very good at treating acute mania. What happens afterwards, I think, is very questionable. So this is a study by Kessing and colleagues published in the British Journal in 2013. These are people in Copenhagen who were discharged after an episode of mania. They went to standard care, which in Copenhagen is very good, or a mood disorders clinic. And you can see the relapse rate from mood disorders clinics is much less than standard care. This is because I think the standard care is oriented towards treating the episode, not preventing future episodes. We've replicated this. We published the paper about, uh, I think, November or December last year. We applied the same uh, protocol, which is psychoeducation plus the BAP guidelines, uh, to a group of people who were frequently readmitted for mania, and we reduced the rate of manic relapse over the course of the next few years by 80%. An 80% reduction in manic relapse. Now, if we had a new treatment that did that, this would be extraordinary. But this is simply applying the best evidence, the best practice in a longitudinal framework. But that's mania. Treating depression is the number one goal for patients. And as you can see, the evidence base is very limited. Now, this is the largest study that Sue McElroy and I did. This is the largest study of SSRI monotherapy in bipolar 1 or bipolar 2, and it didn't show any advantage over placebo. So antidepressants have a huge evidence base, 116,000 people in trials in unipolar disorder, but nothing worthy in bipolar. There's evidence for quetiapin and lamotrigine, combination of olanzapine and fluoxetine, but little else. Okay, I want to spend the last five or six minutes just talking, going back to cognition and talking about pharmacological and psychological treatments. So about 25 years ago, I did some studies where I looked at what might be the biological cause of cognitive impairments in mood disorders. We gave glucocorticoid treatments high doses of cortisol to patients, uh, to healthy volunteers for a week, and we caused impairments in mood like we were seeing in patients, and these were fortunately reversible. So therefore, the notion that you might be able to block high levels of stress hormones has taken hold, and various people have tried different strategies. Uh, the one that we've done is using a glucocorticoid antagonist called mifepristone. So this is the first study that we did uh, about 15 years ago now. We added mifepristone to ongoing treatment, and you can see there is some suggestion of a benefit in uh, depressive symptoms, but really quite a large effect on cognition. So this was an experimental medicine study. It was an initial study, and we followed up by doing a larger between-group studies which we published in Biological Psychiatry about five or six years ago. We reproduced 
the large benefit on cognition. So I, don't th I think these two studies together, it's really quite clear. You get a benefit in cognition from blocking the stress hormones. Moreover, in the paper, the benefits from blocking the treatment were proportional to the level of the stress hormone at baseline. So the higher your stress hormones, the greater your improvement when you block this. What was more problematic is in the second trial, we didn't show an antidepressant effect. And this has actually made it very difficult to get further funding for this because we apply to the MRC and so on, and they say, well, there's, there's no benefit for treatment of depressive symptoms, cognition on its own, it's not such a big deal. We've actually gone to uh, more basic studies. We're looking at effects on brain imaging of mifepristone, but I think this is still a treatment avenue that's worth considering. The next form of treatment I want to talk about is cognitive remediation. Multiple types of cognitive remediation exist. Uh, not everything that says it's cognitive remediation is. There's a lot of uh, poor quality versions out there. But my colleague in the Institute of Psychiatry, Professor Dame Till Wikes, has a computer program called Circuits. I've actually put the uh, reference here for people if they want to look up and see what it is. This improves cognition in schizophrenia with an effect size of between 0.2 and 0.4. So that's a, a small effect size. But remember the Dunedin study. People who became schizophrenic were on average impaired well before onset. Uh, and this is improving cognition in that group. Now, till uh, no one's really done the studies in bipolar disorder, but Till and I have done a study in bipolar disorder, and we've just finished it last week. We just unlocked the data last week. And this is actually the first place that I'm going to show the data. Uh, we've not published this yet. So this was a group of uh, euthymic bipolars. So they were well, uh, and we didn't select them for cognitive impairment. We didn't enrich for cognitive impairment. That's a methodological point, because some people say that if unless you have a criteria of a certain amount of cognitive impairment, you're unlikely to show an effect. Nevertheless, in our group, we saw really quite striking benefits compared to the control group. So, firstly, patients liked it. We had a 7% dropout rate in the cognitive remediation group versus 16% in treatment as usual. Now, you might say, what does that matter? Well, cognitive remediation is hard work. You've got to do lots of homework. You've got to see your therapist twice a week. It's not a trivial thing. Uh, I mean, it really is. The trial itself was feasible. People liked it. They came in. We improved a whole range of things. IQ functioning went up significantly. Executive functioning went up. Verbal and digital memory. So this was much better in the CRT group than the non-CRT group. And lastly, an echo of what uh, Kessing found with his uh, mood clinic and also what we argue with, cog with cognitive impairment is that the people who got the cognitive remediation had lower treatment as usual costs. So less money was spent treating them uh, than the group who didn't get cognitive remediation, showing that potentially this approach may be beneficial in a cost-effective manner. So that's the first cut. We're going to be writing this up, and hopefully it will be published uh, in the next year or so. But I think this sets the scene for us doing further studies of cognitive remediation in bipolar disorder. Now, the obvious question is, should we be combining this with effective pharmacology? Uh, of course, the answer is yes. So to summarize, bipolar disorders are common, clinically complex, and costly. The diagnosis requires skilled psychiatric uh, input, uh, but it's complicated by symptom overlap, heterogeneity of patient symptoms, comorbidity, and residual symptoms. Early, accurate diagnosis is very important. What we should really be aiming for is not just treating the episode, but treating the patient's illness in a more complete sense with restoration of patient functioning, quality of life, and so on. If we give optimized treatment, and that's psychoeducation with uh, pharm pharmacology uh, driven by protocols, with other treatments such as family therapy and so on held in reserve for those who clearly need it, that improves outcome. 
and we've got evidence that we can target new treatment outcomes such as cognition using novel pharmacological strategies and cognitive remediation. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alan, for this uh, excellent uh, overview about uh, bipolar disorder. And uh, I think that um, we have uh, maybe room for five minutes uh, uh, questions or uh, comments. I have a question for you about the <coughs> late onset bipolar. Mm. I don't believe very much in late onset bipolar. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a clinical evidence, but uh, I don't agree that it could be just put together with the classical bipolar disorders. It means that in most of the patients that we examined, they, there were some uh, so-called organic features, uh, frontal, uh, always uh, sometimes temporal frontal particularly. Uh, in other cases, do you have a sub, sub, sub syndromal forms? Never exactly. So, so they are a bit at variance in what is the classical bipolar disorder. What do you think about it? Yes, I agree with you entirely. I mean, uh, we, uh, we did a big study of uh, late onset bipolar, which we defined as 50 years plus, with no illness before. Now, you're absolutely right. You can't rule out subsyndromal forms. The late onset had much less of a family history. So even when there's no obvious organicity, you can't be sure that this isn't a separate process. And I think, actually, that's a good way of subfractionating bipolar disorder by the age of onset. That's why I put it there. I think in a general sense, if you look at mood disorders in old age, and we see this a lot with depression in the clinic, we see this uh, question, is this dementia or is this depression? And, of course, you know, one doesn't rule out the other because the depression can be a prodrome of the uh, dementia. But I totally agree. I think 50 and above. My patient who I saw, who had his onset in his 60s, uh, I only followed him up because I left Newcastle, but I only followed him up for about seven or eight years. I still think that if I'd followed him up longer, uh, we would have seen an organic problem. Yeah. The other problem was, uh, the, other, the other point that you, you touched, very important, was the uh, Cipriani, Cipriani paper oh. that was so, so misleading for yes. us. I mean, we, we, he, he caused to Italy, at least in Italy, a lot of troubles uh, to, uh, in the hospitals because we have all the administrators say, but uh, you, you see this is in the Lancet that haloperidol is working for, for bipolar. Why do you want to spend more? And this is just because we have pharma behind. This is was a big mess. Ab it, it ab absolutely. In some hospitals. Absolutely. This is why I show this article, because uh, this graph, because we had our pharmacists say, well, why not just use haloperidol? Uh, now, Goy Kalekia from Barcelona has done a very nice meta-analysis. The rates of post-manic depression are twice if you use haloperidol compared to atypicals. You, you all know that. But... And every experienced clinician knows that post-manic depression is difficult to treat. So really this again argues that you shouldn't just be taking snapshots. You should be looking at as long as possible. We, ha we had exactly the same problem. Sono domande o commenti? There's a question there. Sicuramente preso dell'osso. Prego. Microfono. Preso dell'osso ha una voce tonante per cui... Thank you, Professor Young, for, for your lecture. I just want a <coughs> uh, quick comment on staging, because uh, yes. when you talk about the progression of bipolar disorder, you think this concept is useful in, uh, in bipolar disorder and can be applied to all patients? Yes, I think it's a useful concept if done in uh, the correct manner. So uh, the staging that was applied to bipolar disorder initially had cognitive impairment as an early feature because they took that from schizophrenia where it is a prodromal feature. That's not the case in bipolar disorder. So you've got to be aware of it. The other point I would make is that if you look at staging in cancer or something like that, it's inevitably progressive. This, to my mind, this is not the case in uh, bipolar disorder. We see patients who actually show recovery. We had one patient, actually a nun, uh, bipolar nun, who, when we treated her, we got her euthymic, uh, 
her scores on neurocognition went from the 10th percentile up to the 70th, and she stayed very well. She was actually a lithium responder. She'd never been given lithium. So I think you have to be aware of the uh, problems of staging, especially the idea that the arrow points only one way for bipolar disorder. My experience is that some patients can show a great deal of recovery. Okay, is another, yeah. any other comment? One question there, I think, yeah. Carla. Thanks for the, the lecture. Uh, which test do you use for cognition? Which tests? Yes. Well, there is a battery done by Lundbeck called the Think battery, which you can actually get on your iPhone and which has a simple way of measuring executive functioning, spatial working memory and so on. Uh, we have a full battery of tests where we measure everything. Uh, we are actually constantly re-examining this. So we have pencil and paper tests, we have the Cantab tests and so on. We are trying to develop virtual reality models of uh, cognition. So, for example, we have a virtual reality model of spatial working memory. To my mind, this is much better than a two-dimensional. I mean, spatial, spatial memory is three-dimensional. Having it on a flat surface is, is not the same. And also, there's a, there's a virtual reality model of executive function, which is related to shopping, because shopping... Uh, is um, something where you need to have attention, you need to have a plan, you need to have a working memory, and so on and so forth. Women are much better at shopping than men, and perhaps that just means they've got better brains, really. Uh, a second question. Uh, is there a brief uh, rating scale for cognition in uh, bipolar disorder? Yeah, something there's a like whole, uh, there's a whole, like there's a whole range of scales. And in actual fact, uh, we have a working group from the uh, International Society of Bipolar Disorder, which I'm on, and we have a paper in press which is coming out with the uh, preferred way of measuring, uh, measuring uh, cognition and bipolar disorder. So if you keep your eye on the... Uh, bipolar Disorder Journal that will be coming out there. And also Roger McIntyre, myself and others, possibly some of whom are in the room, have published a paper about assessing cognition and bipolar disorder. So you should be able to find those online.